Welcome everyone to our February 2024 International Environment Forum monthly webinar where we work to encourage community and action around environmental issues around the globe. Our speaker for our webinar today is Rosie Poirier. She lives in Canada. She's a marine scientist, underwater photographer, and an artist. She works in sustainable resource management and conservation. She is a serial IEF uh, speaker at our uh, panels and conferences and such. Um, Rosie has spent many years doing field work with a variety of marine animals, including sharks and whales and fish. She recently completed a year as the North American Our World Underwater Scholar, studying marine resource management projects around the world. And she's going to share some of the stories that she's collected around the world with us today. Now she focuses on conservation strategy and accelerating programs of action in the sustainability sector, working with nonprofits and communities. And I love hearing about the ocean. So I'm very excited about today's talk. And uh, Rose is gonna speak for maybe 40 minutes or so, and then open up the floor for questions and discussion. So write down your questions and uh, get ready for 40 minutes from now when you can discuss them with her. Um, Rosie, I will now hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Keila, so much for the introduction. Um, I love talking about the oceans. It's my passion, and it's also something that, although not everyone has the opportunity to directly connect with, everyone is connected to. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with my presentation. Um, one moment, I'm just make sure it's working. It's looking great. Yeah, are you seeing it in full screen? This yes. is good. Okay, perfect. If anything messes up with the visual, please let me know. Uh, so my presentation topic is called Oceans of Hope. And this, this title came out of uh, the scholarship year that I had um, a year ago. I had the wonderful opportunity of being the North American Our World Underwater Scholar which uh, provided me the funding and the resources and the network to be able to work with communities around the world and to learn about the ocean solutions that they've been working on and their unique environments within their unique cultural contexts. Um, so this is really a story of ocean solutions and community science. Gila did a great job introducing me, so I feel like I hardly need this slide. Uh, but I am a diver, marine scientist, artist, and underwater photographer. I've done a lot of different forms of diving, been recently upgrading my training to include cave and tech diving. I've spent a lot of time on the water as a marine field researcher and have also been working on sustainability strategy and consulting. Um, and in my past, I have worked with a variety of marine animals and various ecosystems, have spent quite a quite some time working with sharks, four years working with whales, have most recently been working more intensely in kelp forest ecosystems. Um, and what I've learned from all of this is that these same themes keep coming back. Uh, the theme of management, resource management around fisheries, marine protected areas, the science, including citizen science and more traditional science and novel science techniques such as eDNA, storytelling, communications through photography, film, and art, um, and then culture, which is almost the most important one. This is about our human interactions with blue economies, uh, the way that we are interacting and engaging with the oceans. And this is the one that is 
in fact, influencing the oceans the most. So the intersection of humans and the oceans is the area that I love to work in. I really enjoy the dynamics and being able to work with different communities um, in terms of improving the way that we're interacting for the future and also learning from the, the lessons of the past and some of the, the traditions of the past that are have withstood the test of time. So it's really interesting because we rely on the oceans for key services, regardless of where you are in the world, you're relying on the oceans in some way, shape or form. And typically these fall under three different categories. The first would be provisioning services. These are the most easy to quantify. Things like food, transportation, minerals, fuel. Then we have regulating services, which are a little bit harder to describe. This is the way that the, the oceans are regulating the world and how we know it, providing oxygen, regulating our weather patterns, providing storm barriers. And then we have the cultural services, which is the way that we interact, learn, play, develop our culture around, around the oceans. But despite relying on them so heavily and having this intense connection, the oceans are in peril and they're struggling. Ecosystems around the world are are collapsing um, due to negative human interactions. So the big question is what is happening and, and what are we doing? So there are challenges from overfishing, pollution, climate change, ocean acidification, habitat destruction, among many more. Um, so I'm gonna bring that back and share with you a little bit of the journey that I've experienced in the last eight years of my career in the ocean field. Um, and scale it back to some lessons that I was learning early on about being able to look at the oceans and our relationships with them as an interconnected ecosystem in order to develop stronger, more sustainable structures for the future. So I spent four years in the Pacific Northwest um, working with whale conservation, and um, we collected data on boater interactions with whales, boat disturbances, um, compliance with new regulations, and we did a lot of boater educational programs, and we looked at the way that um, boat interactions on the water were influencing the whales. So we were focusing in particular on a specific population of orca called the southern resident killer whales that have been hugely studied, um, are probably the most studied population of orca whales in the world, um, in an area where there's high um, high metropolitan activity. You have Vancouver, you have Seattle, you have some really big cities um, right on the coast in, in the same coastal ecosystem that the Southern resident orcas are inhabiting. And human relationships with whales have changed a lot in the last 50 years. Um, so indigenous communities have been living there for thousands of years and have a really strong relationship and respect to the whales. But when colonists came, they had a completely different look. Um, they feared the whales, they found them to be a nuisance, they saw them as competition and fishing, and for many years they were they were killing them for no other reason than those. And it was not uncommon in the 60s to see orca whales that had bullet wounds and bullet scars in their skin and, and easy to see on their backs. And around that time in the 60s, um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada had actually mounted this 50 caliber machine gun for the sole purpose of shooting orcas as they would pass through the strait. And things rapidly changed when a young orca was captured and brought to the Vancouver Harbor um, by the Vancouver Aquarium. And not only was it captured, but it itself captured the hearts of the people. It only lived for three months, but it really changed people's perspectives of the whales. And then that turned into a whole other challenge that brought the onrush of the aquarium trade. And so now, okay, orcas were not being senseless, senselessly killed in the same manner as before, but now they were being targeted for this aquarium trade. And people living on the coast never saw that as an issue because in their minds, they thought, oh, we see whales all the time. There must be hundreds, thousands. Um, but what was quickly realized through a researcher named Michael Biggs who was developing this method of photo IDing the whales, which uses the combination of their dorsal fin and their saddle patch, which is the white patch that you see um, uh, just behind the dorsal to identify the whales. And they quickly realized that in this population that they thought there were hundreds of thousands, there were actually only 72. Um, so this was the first official census 
of the population. So there are three different pods within the clan, uh, but there are 72 at this time in 1975. So this brought the end of the aquarium trade uh, because scientists were able to prove that there were not many whales um, and that they could not support like a global aquarium trade in that way. So that was it, no wild capture of whales, no more hunting of whales. Um, and you saw a slow increase, a decrease, a rapid increase. And now here we are, this is after nearly 50 years of protection. Well, this is in 2019. So um, this graph is not fully up to date, uh, but I, I believe the last time I looked, um, I think there's only 72 remaining. So this is after 50 years of strict protection. And here we are, we have the same number of whales as we started with in the first place. Um, when we began the census in 1975. So the question is, okay, well, what is affecting them then? So we stopped hunting them, we stopped removing them. Well, there's a lot of things that are playing a role. You have a high level of boat disturbances, you have acoustic disturbances. It's not just the physical disturbance of the boats, but also the sound from shipping traffic that's affecting them. These animals echolocate to locate their prey. Um, they're highly acoustic creatures, they rely on acoustics far more than they do in their their sense of sight. Um, so all of these, and then there's pollution, um, and these animals are some of the most highly polluted animals in the world. Southern residents, the only, the only animal that supersedes them as the transient orcas, because they eat higher in the trophic level than the residents who eat fish. Um, but when these animals wash up on shore, they're labeled as toxic waste from the high level of toxins that's accumulated in, in their blubber. So this is really interesting. But at the end of the day, this is a graph that was, that was uh, these are two graphs that were overlaid on top of each other. So this is a graph of the Chinook abundance along the coast overlaid with a graph of uh, the Orca abundance. So maybe they would have been able to handle one stressor, like one stressor such as acoustic pollution, or one stressors such as um, toxic pollution. But when you overlay all these stressors one on top of the other and then narrow it down to their food system and you see that fish populations are collapsing along the coast as well, then it, it gives a very clear view of what is happening. So we have to be able to look at an ecosystem as a whole in order to figure out what is going on and how can we improve it. So this is one example. And food systems play a role in in everything. It's not just about the oceans. We have to look at our food systems um, and any form of conservation to understand what's happening within the ecosystem because food systems are the interspecies interactions. So another example, I'm just going to briefly go over this one. I didn't have the chance to work with this project directly, but white shark tourism in South Africa um, had been collapsing. So for approximately 20 years, white shark tourism was very popular in South Africa. And then people were blaming it on the orcas. They're saying, oh, these pods of orcas have come through. They're eating up all the sharks. And now there are no more white sharks because quickly, 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 over a matter of approximately five years, um, they weren't seeing the same amount of white sharks that they had previously been seeing. And um, the tourism industry had been suffering. But when you start to look into the data, you see that actually around this time when they were seeing this collapse, there was a re renewed restrictions of fishing regulations that allowed for the collapse of one of the great sharks, main food chains. So the sharks are eating smooth hound and soup fin sharks, a huge portion of their diet. And um, due to unsustainable harvest rates from 2016 to 2019, there was not enough prey for them. So again, looking at these food systems and understanding, okay, humans are affecting the trophic level. Um, and it's really important for us to manage the way that, that we're removing resources from the ocean to understand what is happening to some of these more larger, more charismatic creatures. So again, food systems are representing interspecies interactions. They're really at the core of conservation strategy and looking at ocean health. And food production, if we're looking at it from the lens of climate change, is a major driver of climate change and destruction of nature. It accounts for nearly one third of greenhouse gas emissions overall and 40% of land use and 70% of water use globally. So our food systems are, are a huge part of the puzzle. We have to be able to look at them and to figure out, okay, how can we need food? That's no deny. There's no denying that, but we have to look at how can we extract, how can we utilize resources in a way that upkeeps the health 
of the ecosystem. So here I was with these big questions going into my year as a scholar, and I had the opportunity to engage and interact with a number of incredible organizations, initiatives, and projects. And one of those that really was changing my perspective was Ground Fisheries, was my first project of the scholarship year that brought me to Ground Fisheries Management in Canada, aboard a commercial halibut fishing boat, again in the Pacific Northwest in the same region that I've been studying whales for four years. Um, and I spent, I did my undergrad on Vancouver Island, which is on the west side of Canada. And we had talked a lot about fisheries, but at no point had I in any of my undergrad and any of my coastal management courses, had anyone talked about a fisheries that was well managed or shared an example of what that looks like. So we live in a world where approximately, the data varies, but approximately 2 million people around the world are relying on fish as their primary source of protein. So to overlook fisheries is a huge oversight. And to say that there's no such thing as well managed fisheries, again, is completely ignoring the fact that there are a lot of people who rely on fish for protein and that we have a responsibility to well-managed fisheries and to show examples of well-managed fisheries where they do exist because we do, fisheries is not going to disappear. That's That's been part of um, our food systems from time. So I got to spend this amazing two weeks with this fishing family and got to pepper them with my questions. We had no phone service the entire time. We were out like in the in the middle of the street in the ocean um, and just got to chat. And I asked them so many questions. I dove head in. I'd never done any kind of fishing like this before. I had only just maybe like spearfished or fished off a dock, but this was a completely different style of fishing. And they had a lot of methods in which they were being monitored through third party monitoring systems. So they had a self monitoring system where they were recording their own data via these clickers and on an iPad. So all the data that was recorded on the clickers would then be inputted on an iPad. They also had a mounted camera that was monitored by a third party that would then analyze how many fish were being brought up, how many were being tossed back, um, and they would be audited in that manner. And then when we would hit the dock with our catch, again, a third party company was there to count the catch, um, to record the numbers, and all of this was being heavily monitored. So it was really interesting to see this, that there is monitoring fisheries um, and ground fisheries management in Canada is actually, it's it's been, it's an integrative system that has implemented some really interesting strategies and are being studied by other countries around the world. So one of the interesting things that they had done, that ground fisheries in Canada had done, was this implementation of quota share management in order to tackle the issue of bycatch. So with a lot of fisheries, you have a challenge of bycatch where you're winding it with it where you're winding up with large amounts of an untargeted species and often with bycatch it goes back into the ocean dead as waste um so one of the things that they tackled in terms of ground fisheries management was to develop quota share so before if you were halibut fishermen you would be solely allocated a certain amount of halibut that you can catch and that was it you could only catch halibut so if you pulled up anything else it had to go back as waste Whereas now what they were doing with fisheries management was, okay, when you're a halibut fisherman, you're allocated your poundage of halibut that you can catch. And then additional smaller quotas for things that you are likely to pull up as bycatch. And then if you go over those amounts, you have to pay a fine or you have to be able to trade. So maybe you could trade if you're pulling up a lot of black cod, a black cod fisherman pulled under their quota, you could trade and you could buy some of their quotas so that you don't have to pay a fine. And this way, instead of pulling up all everyone, one another's fish, throwing them back in the ocean dead, there was a more, this system was more reflective of the reality that, okay, it's very hard to target just one species and different types of fisheries. So being able to allocate and share quota and when they're delegating the quota for the year, let's say 70% goes towards halibut fishermen and the remaining 30% of the quota is allocated to other fisheries that are likely to pull up a small amount of halibut. But what this was also, so this is an example of all the fish were tagged and tracked um, at the dock. So what this was creating was these forms of de facto marine protected areas. So it's not a marine protected area because that operates under completely different regulations. But what they were explaining to me aboard the boat was there were certain areas that they wouldn't fish and that nobody with a halibut license or anyone with uh, would fish because they are too likely to pull up 
a species of fish that they don't have quota for or they don't have enough quota for. So there were areas where, despite the fact that you were allowed to fish there, there wasn't like a marine, there wasn't a protected area or regulations to not fish there. Boats would not go. And so it was showing me along the map areas that were heavily fished and areas that were not, and how this would also rotate depending on seasonal patterns. So this was a really interesting form of management that I had never heard of, even though on this map, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is where I studied on the, the southern tip of Vancouver Island. And this is a region where you have all this halibut fishing. So this is happening right in my own backyard. And I never heard about this management system once. So I think it's really important to share about stories that are that are changing the standard. And there's not to say that this method is perfect and that the, we're always improving upon our methodology. There's still challenges um, with any form of fishing, but you adapt and you, you improve and you use the data to inform future changes. So it was really interesting to see this happening. Um, another opportunity that I had was to work with the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, and they were taking a completely different tack in terms of sustainable fisheries management. They were looking at land, aquaculture, and fishery science. So they were doing every single uh, project that they had ongoing was trying to tackle a specific challenge. So they had some projects that were looking at urchin management or seeing, uh, looking into urchin management um, and urchin raising on land. So they were trying to see if they could harvest wild urchins and then raise them on land for the unagi or the uni market. Um, because urchins are a big challenge um, in the Pacific Northwest right now. Uh, but one interesting project that they were working on was with this particularly interesting slimy looking fish called the prickleback and uh, the unagi market, which is freshwater eel. So unagi is hugely popular in sushi, um, but it has a higher carbon footprint because it is a carnivorous fish. Uh, so they were looking at if it was possible to raise prickleback Close, in a closed loop system on land and be able to shift the unagi market of freshwater eel to prickleback, who is a herbivorous fish. And herbivorous fish have a lower carbon footprint than carnivorous fish because they can just eat algaes and seaweeds and are eating lower in the trophic level. So this is this is a, a prickleback and it has actually when it's cooked a very similar texture and flavor to the freshwater fish. So they hadn't they hadn't summarized this project yet, but this was in this is in progress. Um, and it was really interesting to look at the ways that science can directly tackle specific issues within the food market, the economic system. They had a lot of really interesting projects ongoing. Um, and this is some of the seaweed and algae cultivation and kelp cultivation that they had going on on land. Um, they were cultivating various forms of seaweed and they were selling some of these to restaurants, some of them for animal feed. Um, and algae, seaweeds and kelp are really strong carbon um, carbon stores. They, they grow very quickly, they store a lot of carbon. Um, so this form of farming is really effective at drying down carbon from the atmosphere. So Another really interesting initiative that I had the chance to explore, and all of these are so dynamically different and are really, this one in particular, it took me a while to, to kind of wrap my head around. So they have in the Cayman Islands, they have this Cayman Turtle Center where they're combining food systems and conservation. So a lot of places in the world, we see sea turtles as something that you would never consider as a as a food source um, or would look down on people who are eating it. But in many cultures, sea turtle was part of the traditional diet. And in Cayman, people have been eating sea turtle for a generation. Um, but unfortunately, um, sea turtles were decreasing um, rapidly around their, their coastal area. And it wasn't necessarily all directly related to the local harvest of sea turtles. A lot of that also has to do with um, activities in the region, loss of habitat for nesting, um, all kinds of other challenges, you know, maybe loss of food source, loss of, um, so it wasn't to say that like 
the local harvest was to blame, but it was definitely adding a pressure. So what the Cayman government did is they restricted local harvest. So people were no longer allowed to harvest turtles in the wild. But recognizing the fact that a restriction like that could result in high levels of poaching, what they did is they started the Cayman Turtle Center. So they had a brood stock of sea turtles that they were breeding on land and a certain number of the turtles would be raised for harvest. And then majority of the eggs were then going to be released back into the wild or either, either they would bury them in the soil on the beach or they would raise them in incubators and let them go when once they'd hatched or sometimes they would raise them for a little while on land and give them what they call the jump start. Um, and this was where they would release them after they'd been they've been living in the ecosystem for six months. Um, because out of approximately every hundred eggs um, that are laid by a female sea turtle, there's only one that survives to adulthood. Um, and they're heavily preyed upon when they're small. Um, so when they were giving them that jump start, it was with the hope of giving them a higher chance of survival in the wild as they had grown larger with larger shells. Um, so this was really interesting and I'm always a little bit skeptical. So I go, hmm, okay, well, this sounds interesting, but I'm curious. Uh, but they've been doing a lot of eDNA and DNA studies of the turtles to see if this was, if this was actually improving the local population around their islands. Um, so they've been extracting blood samples um, from females that would return to nests and they determined that 85% of the turtles that were returning to nests were actually related, had DNA related to the broodstock that um, they were raising in the Cayman Turtle Center. So they were returning to nests on the islands. They were seeing an increase in the number of sea turtles with the introduction of this program. Um, and this is, again, where data helps us understand what is happening um, to be able to see, okay, are our management techniques effective? Do we need to adjust? And I found this was this was really interesting because it was a solution that was culturally relevant um, because it was respecting the fact that local customs were to eat sea turtle. Um, it was ecologically effective as it was boosting the local populations of sea turtle and hopefully in the surrounding areas as well. Um, and it was this really interesting example of combining food systems and conservation. So these are a few images. Um, this is where they, on the far right, you can see this is where they would keep the eggs and where they would hatch. Um, these were some of the, the jumpstart turtles that they had. Um, and then this was during a release. So we helped with a midnight release of a bunch of sea turtle hatchlings um, and helped them make their way to the ocean. And you only use red lights at night because uh, red lights are less disruptive to them and won't disorient them when they're trying to follow the moonlight into the ocean. Um, now, another project that um, was really helping to shift my perspective was working with the Marine Protected Area Networks and the Coral Triangle region. So marine protected areas are hugely important in terms of management techniques because marine protected areas allow you to protect um, important key nursery habitats, transitory regions, marine protected areas have the ability to cause spillover effect where you can very effectively protect an area and the abundance of that area is spilling over into surrounding areas. Um, so they're, uh, they're, they're a very heavily recognized tool in conservation strategy and there is a current global push to protect 30% of oceans by 2030. Um, so I had the chance to work with Coastal Conservation and Educational Foundation, CCEF, where they were establishing and maintaining MPAs through community consultation. Um, and this is, this is another example of really working with the, the local communities, working with the, the food systems and fisheries. So they had worked heavily with the local fishing communities. And initially the fishermen were really skeptical, standoffish to work with them because when they think protected area, they think restrictions, no longer being able to fish, no longer being able to support their livelihood and their families. But instead CCEF came in with this goal to consult and to work with them. And so 
slowly over time as they were building the trust, they were asking them questions about fishing areas, what they had been observing, using the observations to implement um, the strategies, consulting, communicating. Um, and then the first fisheries restrictions were put in place but they had been done in community consultation. And as they were seeing the results of these implementations of management strategy and seeing an increase in, instead of a decrease in terms of their catch, um, over time, this built a really strong bond of trust. Um, so this took years to implement, but what the fishing communities were seeing was that with the management, they were actually having more fish. So instead of what they were initially fearing of, oh, you know, we're going to have these restrictions, we won't be able to fish, um, and said they were able to catch more with less effort. Because one of the challenges with decreasing fish stocks is that it takes way more time, effort, resources to catch the same amount of fish. Um, so this was really inspiring, and I got to join on some of the interviews and, and um, local conferences. Um, and it was it was just very inspiring to see what uh, community consultation can bring. Um, and in a similar area, Nusa Penida Island, this is in Indonesia instead of in the Philippines, uh, they had another similar, they had a, a similar strategy in terms of community involvement, but here they were involving the local community and the data collection. So they were using two different forms of data. This was on the left is a more traditional style with the point intercept transect. Um, this was to monitor the effectiveness of areas that were already being protected to see, um, to see what the tourism pressure was on these highly frequently dives, highly frequented dive sites, um, and to see, to collect data on future management. So the point intercept transect, the issue with it is that you need a highly trained individual to be able to go and visually identify um, either the fish or the, the, the bentos. Um, and they go along a transect and they're recording what they see. Whereas we were strategizing a new method, which was the photo quadrat where they could engage local divers from local dive centers who aren't necessarily trained to identify every species of coral or every species of fish, but can still go out and conduct this style, this, this data collection. So instead they go down the transect and they take pictures using this quadrat that you see right up here. I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but I've been pointing with it. Um, yeah, you can. Okay. <laughs> um, so utilizing the quadrat, and then they are then uploading the pictures to an online server that is using AI to ID, ID the coral types. Um, and then, of course, you have a human going and checking the data, but it greatly reduces the amount of time that's needed in terms of data collection. You can engage more locals to collect this data. Um, and then they're part of the process. They're getting to spend time um, in the ecosystems that we're trying to protect. And yeah, it was it was really interesting to see these these ways of engaging the community, the different methods, the different styles. Because um, at the end of the day, for management to be effective, there needs to be a high level of community engagement and consultation. Um, so one of the, the points I wanted to mention as well is with marine protected areas, they're often protecting critical habitats. Um, and this can be nursery ecosystems like what you're seeing here. This is a mangrove ecosystem in New Providence in the Bahamas. Um, I took this shot by drone. Um, and it's a very small marine protected area, but it's a very important one. And it's they've they designed this boardwalk and this pavilion so that people can access and snorkel and visit the mangrove as this is one of the few remaining um, intact mangrove habitats on the island um, because New Providence is where the capital of the Bahamas is. It's a very small island, only seven miles by 21 miles, um, and it has a population of over 200,000 people. So that's quite a lot of people in a small space. Uh, but one of the challenges is, is that it is so small and marine protected areas don't operate in isolation you have to look at the surrounding area and sometimes um 
we are not effectively managing or communicating with the community and engaging them. So this is an example of how that is a challenge. So this is the same bonefish pond. It's called it's called bonefish pond. Um, this protected area, and here it is from a different angle. Um, so right on the top is where you can see the edge of bonefish pond, and right here you're seeing coastal development occurring just adjacent to uh, the protected area. So they've put a boom here to try and limit some of the silt, but this silt is still drifting into that ecosystem. The development, the noise. This is a nursery habitat where small juvenile fish are sheltering within the shallows. So when fish are in their juvenile state, it's because they're in their most vulnerable state. They're, they're smallest, least protected. That's why they go to mangrove coastal habitats where they can be protected within the roots. Um, so having this incredible disturbance happening just adjacent and having this development happening immediately adjacent to the ecosystem is not conducive to its protection. Um, so we have to be able to look at these systems as a whole and manage these areas as a whole system and to really integrate the surrounding communities in their protection and management. So this is um, the final example that I'm going to share of a really effective community management program. Um, this one I was working on in late August of 2023 and it's really impressive what this community has managed to do. So these are the kelp forests of Baja, California. And kelp forests all along the Pacific Northwest have been decreasing enormously. In some areas of California, even decreasing by more than 90%. And in the coast, the West Coast of Mexico, they're seeing similar levels, 80%, um, 80 and more in certain regions. But the healthiest kelp forests that you can find in the Baja region are the ones that are being protected or managed, managed by the community cooperatives, the fishing cooperatives. So this is an, ex is an example of uh, the challenges facing the kelp forest. So through mismanagement of fisheries, you have the you have these urchin barrens. Um, so urchins predate on, well, they eat kelp and they eat it very fast and very voraciously. So this is a picture of a kelp. This is bull kelp. This is taken in British Columbia in Canada. And you can see every single strand of the kelp is being eaten by an urchin. It's just being stretched to the maximum and they can eat an enormous amount of kelp every day. And the challenge with urchins is that um, they go into a dormant stage. When there's no food around, they don't die. They go into a dormant stage. Um, so. When they're in their dormant stage, uh, they will wake back up and start eating again as soon as there is a food source available. So that means once a, once, a, once an urchin barren is established, it's really hard to reverse it without some kind of external removal of the urchins. Um, because the moment that the kelp starts to grow back, they're going to eat it back down into the ground. So this is an example of what it looks like when it's a full-on urchin barren. It just means that there is no kelp um, and kelp attaches itself to the rocks. Um, so they've just eaten it all completely. You have a few other critters um, here, but for the most part, you're just seeing like a carpet of urchins. And these are some of the predators of urchins. The most well-known one that people love to talk about is the sea otter, but it's not always the most significant one in every ecosystem. You also have wolf eels, you have sheep's head, sunflower stars, all of these different species are predating on urchins. Um, and when you're mismanaging the fisheries, overfishing or uh, disrupting the habitat, then um, we lose these, these key predators of urchins. And it's really interesting because um, again, when I was in university, the only predator that they talked about for the urchins were the sea otters. And they always talked about the story that, oh, sea otters, you know, back in the days of the fur trades in the early 1920s, they fished out, they killed all the sea otters. And now we have these urchin barrens and we try to reestablish populations of sea otters, but it takes time, it takes years. And because of this problem that occurred in the past, we now have this issue of urchin barrens. And so it was really, we were, we were always looking for some kind of scapegoat, some kind of way of taking the blame away from what is currently happening in present day. So that was a really easy way of saying like, oh, this problem was created in the past. 
But in reality, what I was learning is this is a problem that's being perpetuated right now in terms of our current fisheries management. It's not just about the sea otters. It's about looking at the entire trophic system um, and recognizing that there are a lot of changes that we can make in terms of managing our fisheries that is going to ensure these strong, healthy kelp ecosystems for the future. So the fishing cooperatives um, were working alongside local community NGOs um, that were helping them manage and develop management systems for their fisheries. And one of the benefits is that the fishing cooperatives were generational. So they've been living on those coastal areas for generations. They had they had that sense of like ownership of that of the land and a sense of stewardship to want to protect it because it wasn't just about them it was about their future generations so if they wanted to leave fish and ecosystems for the future they had to do something today um so alongside the ngos who were helping provide the science the data and the training they were developing these management systems that were proving hugely effective and um, we got to dive in some of the kelp forests that were managed by the fishing cooperatives and they were stunning these gorgeous 3D ecosystems with thriving kelp and full of seals and sea lions and fish. And there were urchins as well, as they should be, but they weren't in overwhelming amounts. They were present in healthy amounts and part of a balanced part of the ecosystem. Um, and this is one of the methods that they were using to collect data. So we spent two weeks out at sea. Um, we were doing both visual surveys and also using eDNA to understand the fisheries. So eDNA is a newer technique for collecting data that is less invasive than some of the, the more standard um, techniques for collecting fisheries data. So often with fisheries, when they're collecting data, they have to go and um, either take a sample of harvest aboard a fishing boat um, which can be more difficult to access, or sometimes they'll do they'll do their own seine nets, or um, you have to do visual surveys, which means that you're only recording what is able to be seen with the eye. And there's a lot of nocturnal species. There's a lot of cryptic species that are difficult to see. So all of these were either they were resource intensive, um, they were challenging, they would be invasive in terms of having to remove fish from the ecosystem. Um, or they, they would have enormous amounts of bias because you're only recording what you see. eDNA is still in development. It does have its challenges, but it is a very good, um, it is a very good reflection of a species presence. Uh, it doesn't do a great job of counting the population, um, but I think in the future, as we continue to develop this method, this is something that uh, we'll be able to estimate more effectively, but it is a really good biodiversity metric to look at presence of different species. So using eDNA, you can determine if critical species are present in an area. And eDNA, you basically scoop out a sample of water and you put it through a filtration system. And then the filtration system is capturing all the particles and then it's processed in the lab and the DNA that has been captured in the filter is then analyzed and you're able to determine species presence. So this is one of the methods that they were using. And this is another example of something that um, is easier to train locals to do. They don't have to be pro they don't have to be experts in fish ID or anything. They can go and collect a water sample, be taught how to filter the water sample and to um, preserve the filtration paper. And then that can be collected um, by local geneticists and scientists who will then analyze the data. So this is me with my scientist friend who's collecting the water sample and these big these skin bottles and we would just scoop it. Uh, I really love this picture because he's behind this curtain of kelp. Um, but what I wanted to leave everyone with from this presentation is really that nature and food production are inherently interconnected. We are part of this natural ecosystem and our food security relies on ecosystem services. And in return at the same time, it is one of the biggest reasons for the loss of these ecosystem services. So now we have a responsibility to rethink the way that we are seeing, that we are seeing our, our food systems and our interactions with the ocean. So energy flow doesn't just go one way. It goes, it goes from top to bottom, it goes from bottom to top. 
And what we need to be focusing on is developing these regenerative food systems. Resilient food systems are restorative. It means that they are improving the environment in which they operate, um, as can be seen with the fishing cooperatives. We don't want to just go into the system and extract. We have to be giving back. We have to be designing um, interactions and systems that are able to withstand the test of time, can be sustained for generations, and are sustainable for a future. And one of the examples of implementing this, and one of the um, really real buzzwords that I honestly, I sometimes buzzwords, <laughs> they're given too much attention, but this one is fantastic. Circular economy is the economic system based on the reuse and regeneration of materials and products. So the more that we're integrating these kind of systems where we're thinking about the system as a whole, that waste needs to recirculate back into the system, um, the more that we're able to see um, our interactions as part of this ongoing cycle. And um, this is one of the sustainable development goals. This is the one sustainable, this is number 14, which relates to life below water. And the goal is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. And this is what the world is working towards. Um, and I want to invite that discussion to broaden, to include more people into it, and to recognize that we are all connected to our ocean ecosystems, and we have a responsibility to steward them. Rosie, your your presentation is just gorgeous. All the pictures are fantastic. It Thank makes you. me feel good about about the world's oceans to to just you, we're sitting here in this in this Zoom meeting, but to look at such <laughs> this photography <laughs> makes a huge difference. Thank you. Yeah, then, most of those pictures I took some of them. I borrowed. <laughs> um, does anyone want to jump in with questions? Winnie, did you raise your hand? Yes. Uh, Rosie, this is the second time I've heard one of your presentations, and it's still stunning. Thank you oh. so much. Um, Thank you. Do you know, uh, you know that it seems our Great Lakes are in great distress? Are, uh, have you run into programs there uh, for restoring the health of the Great Lakes? Um, I know that there are programs that exist. Unfortunately, I don't work with freshwater ecosystems. Um, so my knowledge will be very limited. Um, I'm sure that there's, there's someone who could share a lot better than I could. Bill, you wanna ask a question? Yes, um, it, it, uh, yes, a very good presentation. I, I was quite fascinated. Um, and I was wondering, like, it seems like there's a big parallel between food resource management and um, environment stewardship, but there's also areas where there's a divergence uh, mm. between the two. And I was wondering, like, in terms of the regulations, the people who fund research, uh, the the milieu of which all of this is happening from a, you know, a society a societal perspective uh, are is there a is there a preference over food resource management uh, uh, as a as the approach to doing things or a more holistic approach to of what is good for both biodiversity and uh, food resource management. Well, that's an interesting question because um, often they're looked at separately, but actually um, this year, so I was at COP28 this year, which is the climate conference in, in Dubai. And it was one of the first times that they were really talking about the two in tandem, like tackling biodiversity targets and agricultural targets together and recognizing um, that the two influence one another enormously and that to be able to really affect change you have to be able to look at them in tandem so there are definitely like grassroots projects that focus on the two um but in terms of international policy it's still lagging behind in terms of connecting them um but we are seeing an advancement in that 
that direction. But these are some examples of where um, biodiversity and food systems have been looked at together, like with the fishing cooperatives, recognizing that effective management of the fisheries was uh, supporting more biodiverse and healthy ecosystems. So it's happening all over the world on the ground, but um, the policy is is lagging behind. Well, we sure appreciate your good work in this area. Thank you. Frederick. Thank you. Hi, hi, Rosie, and um, thank you for a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I spent a lot of time in British Columbia, so I <clears throat> and um, I worked with one of the um, fisheries organizations in Prince Rupert. Uh, mm. Well, they were based between Prince Rupert and Vancouver. I don't think they're around now. They were a cooperative, and um, and I knew there were uh, with the ground fish. There was at the time there was uh, uh, quite a mixed bag of. Uh, uh, in terms of monitoring and um, you know what was harvested, I remember uh, I was I was in the I was on the bad side of things. I was in the salmon farming side, and uh, and uh, one of the guys with the company said, "Well, you know, if you want to use um, some hake, I can get you a boatload of hake, you know, as much as you want, and we can put that into the salmon feed." Uh, <clears throat> I, I politely declined. But my my um, I wanted to ask about two things. I wanted to ask about uh, first of all the eDNA whether there is any progress towards being able to quantify uh, the use of the eDNA so as to be able to get a sense of the biomasses uh, relative biomass of, of of particular species of uh, fish that is taken for 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 human consumption, for example. And um, the other question that I have is about cooperatives. It sounds like the California, the Baja, I think, the, is it Baja, California uh, mm -hmm. cooperative? Sounds, it sounds like it worked very well. I worked with um, fishermen um, in Bermuda, and uh, <clears throat> we had, we were regulators, and we had always had a real difficult time to uh, balance the conservation and uh, capture interests. And... Um, there is, you know, the, there was a saying that, you know, a fisherman would take the last, they would, they would compete to take the last fish in the ocean, which I know is a bit, <clears throat> it's, it's not necessarily true, but there is, I think, it sounds like this cooperative movement in, in the Baja is really uh, a very successful and sustainable one. And I wondered if there's ways of, uh, do you see signs as you went around the world of the increased use of the uh, cooperative method, the cooperative model? Um, I don't know about the increased mm -hmm. use because it, it's, it's really interesting because every, every region will have its own like challenges or strengths. So this is kind of a unique region because the cooperatives, they have this generational kind of connection to the, the land and to the fishing area. So then, whereas I find what I've observed and also what's seen a lot in studies is is when, when the fishermen are less connected to the area, then they're, that's where you see a lot less of that stewardship, you know, especially with like poaching that is happening overseas. They don't have any investment in that area. They're just going there to catch the fish. So they don't care if like the fish are no longer there in five years time or longer. So this is something that can really be developed in areas where there has been a longstanding connection between the people and the land. It would be a little bit more difficult um perhaps otherwise um but the cooperative technique is something that should be expanded and integrated in more places um but i don't yeah i i don't know necessarily about like the global movement for it um but that's part of the project is that's where communications really comes into play so that's where like i've worked a lot in the field research side and whereas now i i do very little field research at all and I've been working more in like science communications film storytelling impact strategy and that's where um that plays a really important role because then you can share initiatives that are working and it can inspire change in other places and it, ecosystems that are similar right there's a lot of cub forest ecosystems all over the world in South Africa you have them in in Chile you have them in Canada um so then being able to see an example of a really effective system that can inspire change in similar ecosystems in other regions of the globe um that's where communications plays a 
a huge role. But then it also, yeah, you need you need policy support. So one of the challenges in Mexico is that this is all this is all being led locally and by nonprofits. They don't have a lot of policy support. So then you still have issues around cartels that are poaching um, in the area. Um, but with increased policy support from the government, this would make it a much more robust management method that can be expanded beyond um, these pockets of well-managed kelp forests. Because you would have, you would have like the really beautiful kelp forests, and then not even like a few kilometers beyond, you have nothing. It's completely barren. Um, yeah, I I think I forgot the first part of your. Question. Yeah, just sure whether, fully... whether there's any any um, promise for eDNA um, oh, yes. method being used for biomass estimation or or quantitative relative amounts of fish. Of, of yeah, um, I think it's still a ways off because in order to get to that point, it requires a lot of research and it's going to be at a different pace for a different species. So, for example, like in order to get to that point, they have to do a lot of um, visual surveys combined with eDNA. So then to be able to research in an area where you can effectively measure um, species presence visually, and then to be able to compare that with eDNA and eDNA shedding for that species. So the different species are going to shed at different rates. So then be to be able to effectively calculate the biomass, you have to know what the approximate shedding is going to be. But then that also changes based on current and ecosystem. Um, so that that makes it challenging but i i was you know talking to my friends who work in, gen in genetics that's a direction that they want to see eDNA go but it's still i think it's still quite a few years off from that oh. um okay. thank you yes laura um, yes hello um thank you for the beautiful presentation and also Congratulations for all the amazing work you do in raising awareness of these ocean ecosystems. I have two questions. The first one, I was really curious about the orcas uh, population in that area you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned that there are uh, around 70 left. Mm -hmm. And what was the original population? What was the original population? Because you said already back in the 60s, they were already uh, decreased a lot. What was the original and also are they connected with the other orcas around the world and the, the global population is also very small? Um, and yeah, uh, so that's my first question. Mm -hmm. I don't, I actually don't know off the top of my head what the global population of orcas are, but um, orcas exist in various ecotypes. So even within that region of the Pacific Northwest, where we were collecting this data, there's three ecotypes of orcas. So there's the Southern residents, which are the ones that only have 73 remaining um, that frequent that area. And then you have the transient orcas, which are around just over 300. And then you have offshore that are very rarely seen and they all predate on different, um, different species. So the Southern residents are the salmon eating, they eat exclusively salmon. And then the transients eat like they eat dolphins, they eat seals, they eat sea lions, larger predator, uh, mm -hmm. larger prey. And then the offshore are the ones that go after sharks and they live more in in um, the pelagic environments. Um, oh, but they all yeah. have they all have yearly patterns and and sort of migrations, the transients. Um, yeah, which is studied to various extents. So that population is around 73, but it can only be estimated what it could have been before, which they're estimating would have been somewhere between like 400 to 1,000 individuals. Um, but um, it could be compared to the northern resident population, which is similarly eats salmon. They're very, very similar, but they don't interact. They eat the same prey source but they have their own social structures. Mm -hmm. So they don't interact with one another, even though they have slightly overlapping territories. Um, but that population is over 300. Um, and that's an affected population. So that means that's not reflecting its historical abundance. So the estimation would be like in terms of comparing it to the Northern and comparing it as well, looking at the DNA, um, their genetic variability would be, yeah, somewhere between 300 to maybe at most a thousand historically because they are very they're very closely knit socially so I think even a thousand is a high estimation okay 
Yeah, yeah. and um, I mean, I don't know about the population around Australia, but I, I heard the stories that traditionally the Aborigines used to hunt together with the orcas. And oh, so really? they had some kind of symbiotic relationship between humans and orcas, where they were actually they were actually fishing together. They were helping each other fishing. And when Europeans really? came, that tradition was lost because obviously they were killed by Europeans. Um, but that's the story I heard. The story I heard about Australian orcas. I don't know what the population now. I have no idea. But anyway, that's the my first second I've question. Ever heard that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting. I didn't look further wow. about that, but I thought the story was beautiful. Uh huh. Uh, but but uh, my other question was about the the that. Uh, family fishing story you mentioned you went fishing with them I mm -hmm. was wondering if that they, they have a sustainable approach to fishing and you you show that that's an example of sustainable fishing was it their initiative or was it government initiated or is it is it like regulated is it like due to um, a illegal process or is it like it seems to me that it was an, an initiative but it wasn't clear to me. Yeah, so the monitoring, that three-step monitoring process is government mandated. That's the expectation for halibut fisheries and ground fish management in Canada. But I also had a very um, unique experience on that boat because that that was a boat of fisher, fisher folk who are really dedicated to conservation. So um, the okay. father who owns a boat had a degree and he had like a master's in marine marine policy and management and then the daughter also um she worked heavily in in marine conservation she was on the marine stewardship council she she was an avid diver had been advocating for increased sustainability policy in fisheries so i know that that i wouldn't have necessarily had that exact same experience on just any boat like that was a very unique um family to be working with because they're heavily involved in in sustainability policy and strategy within fisheries. Um, so I'm sure like not all fisheries boats are as supportive of, of the policies as they are. Um, but yeah, the, the monitoring system, that three step with the, the self monitoring, the photo capture and on on the dock that's mandated by government. So all all ground fisheries okay. boats yeah, have yeah. to do that system. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah. Why is it called ground fisheries? Um, because it's fishery, it's fish that um live on the, the benthic seafloor. So they live it's all fish that live on the sea floor bottom. So they're ground fish. Oh yeah. So halibut is like a flat fish that lives on the bottom of the ocean. And um similarly, like lingcod and all of them, they're yeah, they're target species that live at the bottom. And how far out from the land? Or how deep are these fish? Like, how far are they from the from the islands? I mean, we could see the islands. We were never so far out that we couldn't see land. Um, so we were between um, Haida Gwaii or, and um, the mainland. Um, I'm trying to think, what was the range that we were fishing? Maybe like 400 meters deep? One of the most stunning things I realized when I started learning about fisheries is all of this activity takes place right near the continental shelf, right by the, mm. where the people live on land. If you don't know anything about oceans, you think, oh, the ocean, you know, it's this huge thing. There's fish all over, but that's not actually true. All the fish live in the, in the ocean shallows, which are near the land. Is that correct? Did I, am I getting this right? Um, that is definitely the concentration. Um, because that's where you have a lot of nutrients that are circling to the surface. So wherever you find nutrients is where you're gonna find high abundance of fish. And that's where you see like the big schools of fish. That's where the sardine run and all of that is happening on the the continental shelf where nutrients are cycling to the surface because you have a lot of ocean mixing in those areas. Um, but there are still fish out in the pelagic and a lot of migratory um. Uh, fish and whales are migrating so you will find but you're not going to find like a concentrated abundance um except at the those regions like within the shallows continental shelf other like high nutrient then, rich areas according to the law of the sea the um each country gets is it up to 100 miles from their coastline to manage for themselves mm, the ez 
Um, maybe Arthur, <laughs> do you know the answer? <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's 200 kilometers, you know, the 200, 200, 200 miles. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, of course, that's, it's where you have bottom within sunlight is where you get the maximum able to, to use solar production, you know, in the, in the open oceans, there are areas where there are plankton, but the density you know, of photosynthesis is much less than it is in those coastal areas. So it's, you know, it's, it's partly the, the inputs of nutrients. It's partly the fact that when you have a fixed bottom, you may be able to resist currents better. And it's partly because that, so you get this concentration of life in that in, where land and sea interact much more than the open sea. The open sea is much more diffuse from that point of view. But I wanted to, to thank you for sharing so, some positive stories because as somebody who's been depressed by 60 years of experience of what, everything going wrong, and the attempt to apply science to these problems, and how say and how science is 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 not listened to by policymakers in general. And they couldn't couldn't care less. You know, I was you know, I was born and raised on the California coast. You know, I'm a doctor in marine biology. You know, I studied at Stanford and UC Santa Barbara, and I was at Friday Harbor. So I know that well. Back when there were sea urchins and and kelp forests along the coast, you know, this is the 19, 1960s. So mm -hmm. and then of course, then I worked on coral reefs around the world at the time when there were still coral reefs around the world, and now they are collapsing so rapidly. So you know, you're you're describing the few positive attempts to turn the corner in what's been a you know, much a half century of catastrophe with respect to the life in the sea, and it's still going very much in the wrong direction. And now, of course, with climate change and acidification, you know, things are getting worse rather than better in many ways. So I think what you're focusing on now is so important. <clears throat> Because we have to educate the public. We have to, the, the policymakers are the last ones who are going to respond because they're trapped in the economic system where making money is what counts, uh, keeping the economy growing is what counts, and the economic pressures of the commercial fisheries and so on are so so powerful, you know, raping everything, you know, for, in the, for the short term. That still was driving policy. So the more mm -hmm. you can get out into the schools, that the children to be learning this, that gradually the, the public can become more aware how important the sea is and how important that life is, how dependent we are on it, and that therefore that will gradually some pressure to help change things and save something to go forward. Because we have a we have a IF member in Fiji, Austin Bowden Kirby, who's been working for gener for for decades, you know, first on replanting damaged reefs and helping them go back. And now we say, what can you save at a time when global warming is killing off the corals massively around the world and bleaching them. So, you know, it's really a question of what can be salvaged now. And so I hope you can find more examples like the 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 the, the, the Baja California, where they're doing the right thing, saving a few places as models of what still can be preserved. Because it's really a question of saving what we can so that we can hopefully later, as we have more wisdom, try to regenerate what's been lost in the meantime in so many other places, because that's really the, the battle that your generation is having to fight. I'm beyond fighting that battle now. <laughs> I'm trying to change global governance so it listens to the problems at the, at the global level. But uh, you're doing such important work. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it means a lot coming from someone who's worked so long in the field. Um, and I think one of the things that I realized is that hum humans, uh, we have this ability to observe and learn and imitate and and see something and then learn to apply it and um, when I was in university I was constantly frustrated by the lack of focus on solutions and effective tools because I think that as much as it's important to understand what's happening in the world and that we do need to feel the urgency the urgency is important in order to instigate action we also really need to see examples of solutions and things that are working because then you have those in your toolbox and you can learn to apply them to different systems and have at least the imagination of what does the future that we're talking about actually look like because we're talking about oh you know you want net zero you want this you want that but then what are examples of it applied in the field and we need to be showcasing those so that people can imagine what that world looks like and how we can apply it and what are the steps to get there. And it was funny because at the conference I attended last week, um, one of the speakers brought up this concept of green hushing because we know greenwashing and greenwashing happens all the time where companies, industries, they're just um, over glamorizing what they're doing or making something seem green when it's not. But then we have also the opposite problem where these amazing initiatives are occurring and they're not being shared broadly enough. 
And so it's really important to also like champion the things that are working and to share those so that we can learn from each other and to, to also share the challenges go, okay, like we've tried to do this impact strategy um, or carbon reporting and it's not working. So what's happening out there to, to generate these dialogues to contribute to one another's learning and solutions developing. Um, I think Rodney. Rodney. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great presentation. Um, mm -hmm. The comment that Laurent made and, and looking at some descriptions you gave, some of the ecosystems that made me think about um, keystone species studies and that, uh, I don't know, you could argue perhaps that humans for some ecosystems are a keystone species or becoming a keystone species. Yeah, I think that's the direction that we have to move towards. And another realization that I had was growing up, I always learned that like humans were destroying the environment. So in my mind, I was like, oh, you know, we have to mitigate humans to, <laughs> in order to have strong ecosystems. But then the more that you learn about regenerative systems and that regenerative systems have occurred since the beginning of time and that humans have the ability to actually go into an ecosystem and make it stronger and more biodiverse and more healthy and that that should be our standard. Yes, humans, absolutely. We have the opportunity to be ecosystem engineers in the most positive way. And we also have the ability to do it in the most destructive way. But I think teaching people that you're part of the ecosystem, you have a responsibility to make uh, the world around you better um, and how does that look like? And how do we act as stewards? That's the goal. We want to be a positive ecosystem driver and a keystone species. Winnie. Yes, um, here's another question. It really shows my ignorance, Rosie, because back after that terrible tsunami that hit Japan, and then California, uh, or at least the West Coast, uh, was the recipient of things that came off the coast of Japan. I began to worry about the fish and the contamination in the Pacific. Can you speak to that? And did the fisheries have uh, lower um, commercial uh, gain? after that tsunami? Mm, I don't know about the tsunami specifically, but I know that beyond what would have washed up from the, the tsunami or challenges around radiation, um, that area on the West Coast is doing a pretty good job of polluting its waters on its own um, <laughs> through, <laughs> um, through its metropolitan capitals, Vancouver and uh, Seattle. And um, that's why there are such high levels of toxins in, in the orca whales who are at the top of the trophic system. And it's also affecting humans. And it's really interesting because salmon are such, they are like the lifeblood of the West Coast ecosystem. Um, salmon come up the rivers in the fall to lay their eggs and um, they die. They die in the rivers. They die in in the forests, and they're providing the nutrients for the forests themselves to grow. But they've also been hugely important for the people of the coast. Um, and I read this poem one time, uh, written by um, an indig an indigenous writer who was wrote this really heartfelt piece about how something that had been the lifeblood and the nourishment of their communities for so long was now poisoning them. Um, because indigenous communities also have some of the highest levels of toxins of any community on the west coast because they are eating a lot of fish and the fish have such high levels of toxins um so it's it's i mean like reading the poem i i had tears in my eyes because it really talked to that like this is something that's meant to nourish you and protect you and to feed your children and all of a sudden it's it's poisoning you so i don't know um specific like I can't speak off the top of my head about what the the result was from the tsunami and increased pollution in the water and and um long-term effects of of um radiation as well that was coming from the Fukushima reactor um but I do know that there are there are high levels of toxins in um, marine species especially higher up in the trophic level and that is having an effect on people um 
But at the end of the day, fish is still a very healthy protein, but you can do better for yourself to eat lower in the trophic system. It still is a really important source of nourishment, but um, eating lower in the trophic system is better for um, your carbon footprint. And also right now, it's just better for your health in general to expose yourself to fewer toxins. Christine. Thank you, Rosie, for your wonderful presentation. I have some questions all related to plants in the ocean. Uh, you talked about algae and seaweed farming. So how is this done? Uh, do people fertilize their like aquaculture and how do they do that? And is that uh, does it have any negative impacts on the environment? That's my first question. Maybe I stop here. Mm. Um. I mean, with all things, it depends on the method. So there is um, kelp farming that's open ocean um, where they're they're growing the kelp on ropes. Sometimes it's vertical ropes. Sometimes um, it'll be horizontal ropes at the surface. And then they go out and harvest from, um, from the ocean. But then there's also closed loop systems uh, for farming on land. So those have um, typically... Kelp growing has a really low impact on the environment. Um, the only way that I, I could see it harming in the open ocean is if you're growing kelp in an ecosystem that is not traditionally a, a kelp forest and you're shading out like seagrass or something like that um, and blocking the sunlight because kelp does grow very rapidly and um, it creates quite a carpet at the surface. Um, so you have to do it in areas where you're not going to be affecting the native ecosystem that's there so to strategically pick your location um but kelp yeah kelp growing has a really low impact <laughs> as far as i know um uh, as opposed to like open ocean fish farming where you can create an overflow of nutrients in an area that wouldn't that wouldn't otherwise have it or an abundance of one species of fish that is causing di disease to proliferate. Um, it's not really the same with kelp, mm -hmm. um, but I'd have to read into it more intensely to be able to give a more informed response. That's great. Um, uh, now the, the sea urchins that are such a problem, aren't they edible? Uh, Could, yes. Couldn't people make a business out of it? Yes, definitely. The problem is in urchin barrens, um, it means that the urchins are not, once it's an urchin barren, they're not eating enough. So they're in a dormant stage. So their stomach is shrunken. Um, and then it means that it's not marketable. So you can't go and harvest an urchin from an urchin barren and be able to sell it on the market. It won't sell. So if they're going to do that, then um, they have to harvest them and then feed them on land um, in order to grow them and feed them to a state where they will be, can be sold for the uni market of the sushi market. Cause a lot of people do eat urchins and they're very popular and it is a delicacy in, in many cultures. Um, but there could be harvesting. You could establish healthy harvesting in an area where it is a kelp forest already and harvest urchins um, in those areas. And they'll be, they'll be in a state where they can be sold on the market. So I was, um, when I was working with the whale conservation, we were training one of the local um, indigenous bands because they were starting their own marine monitoring system. So they wanted to be trained on cetacean monitoring. And on the last day they dove for urchins um, for us. We just stopped on this shallow kelp and they dove down and grabbed a bunch of urchins. And that was my first time ever trying it. And yeah, those were, they were really beautiful urchins. So for sure you can harvest them, but not from a barren. There has to be some kind of, intermediary action before it can be sold on the market. Thank you very much. Uh, my last question is, what do the um, people in the collective in Baja California do right to in their management of the kelp forest? Like what um, are they doing? Are they um, protecting the kelp from the urchins or, or what are they doing? Well, what they're doing is they're, mon they're managing what they're fishing. So they're not overfishing the predators of the urchins. And that's what's allowed those kelp forests to thrive. 
And then they also, um, they've been trained to monitor and to dive. So uh, they now have, um, they call them sirenas de la natividad. And these are women who have been trained to dive and to collect data. So they also go and monitor for themselves um, the local reefs, uh, or sorry, the local uh, kelp forests. Um, so then they have that data, they can provide, you know, they're monitoring regularly, they can see if there's um, any kind of effect on the ecosystem, decrease of kelp, decrease of certain um, abundance of fish. Uh, but what they're doing is they're managing their fishing of the urchin predators. So they're maintaining the health of the trophic system through that. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's a fantastic note to end on. Rosie, keep taking gorgeous pictures and collecting stories from around the world. And can I call you in a couple of years? Can we do this again with another batch oh, of course. stories? Oh, ah, sure. Ah, yeah, I'm more than happy. Yeah. Also, I'll pop been... my You're email so in the chat. Thank um, you so much for coming and sharing your, your insights on the oceans with us. This is yeah. Awesome. I'm just putting my email there if anyone wants to reach out or has questions. Thank you, everyone. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. It was Thank great you. to meet everyone. Bye -bye. <laughs>